Greetings again in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Pastor H.H. H. Gibbons Sr. Coming to you this morning from On the Wall of Ministries here in Alta Vista, Virginia. We do thank God for you joining us. Those who join us on Friday evening at our Bible Institute of July, we do thank you for joining us. But this morning as we come, we got a beautiful lesson, Expectant Watchfulness, coming out of Psalm 130. This morning, July 28th, fourth Sunday here, lesson 9 out of our King James Version of our Standard Commentary. As we look at our text this morning, it is our, uh, Psalm 130, we're looking at it, our theme is uh, Expecting Hope. And then our lesson aims this morning is to identify the elements of the cause and effect in our text and then uh, define the gesture or the genre of the lament used in Psalm 130 as an example. Then personalize in your writing one of these verses without changing the psalmist's original intent. So each one of us should have uh, some type of watchfulness when we are going through things in life and we understand that God is a God that watches over us each and every day of our life. So as we get into our text this morning, we're going to read our text, then we get into our introduction and our uh, context of our lesson today. Then we'll have line upon line of discussion of our text. So our scripture reads this morning, Psalm 130, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive unto the voice of my supplications. O thou, Lord, shouldest mark my iniquities. O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord, and my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they watch for morning. I say more than they watch for morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for the Lord there is mercy, and to him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all its iniquities. A beautiful lesson again. We want to look at uh, us, uh, looking at the elements of the cause and effect of our text, then define uh, the lament in our text today as an example, then write a personal uh, writing about uh, how to psalm this, the intent of that will make it personal in our own life. So as we get into our introduction this morning, out of the depths, you know, for such a short prayer, Psalm 130 covers a lot of ground. And it begins by acknowledging uh, the terrifying possibilities of human life and ends with the hope of a different future. Yet in reading it, it should not skip too quickly to the end. In this Psalm, the focus does not lie on the outside, Terrible forces precisely on our human sin. The terror that the psalmist is facing comes from the human tendency to allow vices to overcome us. The tendency threatens to take over, take everything we do and are thwarting all of our plans and uh, spoiling all of our intentions and what can be done about this problem of sin. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer noted in The Cost of Discipleship, he said, Together they, the disciples and the church, bring their guilt before God and pray together for his grace. May God forgive not only me my sins, but our sins as a body of Christ. In the sense of both our sin and the possibility of forgiveness, unite us in a central theme to the song and to the Bible as a whole. So in our lesson this morning, our lesson context come out of Psalm 130 is a part of a long cluster, usually psalm of accents, or less often the pilgrimage psalm. And then the psalm in the group may be originated at different times but places, but the thing is it functions together as a psalm for pilgrims entering into the Jerusalem temple in the beginning following their Babylonian exile. The group of Psalms falls in three subgroups, Psalms 120 to 124, Psalms 125, 129, and Psalm 130 to Psalm 134. And perhaps the pilgrim songs, them are different steps on the road to Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley and in the precinct around the temple itself. Psalm 130, in particular, may uh, have served as a part of the uh, of the uh, night vigil as the pilgrims awaited uh, for the dawn, which would uh, turn symbolizing the dawns of God's light in their lives. And but the those uh, hypotheses are reasonably hard to prove. Yet 
that will explain the varying moves in our, our text today and their progression throughout the temple itself. And more certain is that the Psalms together address a wide variety of certain moods and certain concerns. And together they're allowing worshiping community to express anxiety, hope, fear, trust, sorrow, and joy. And that is, they help worshipers bring the entire lives to God, share their lives with each other, and equally await for God's transforming work. In Psalm 130 also moves the pilgrims from the attitude of despair to one of supreme confidence of God's saving work. And when one song focuses on his or her personal suffering, fear and sorrow can overtake faith. But when the focus shifts toward God, inclination to save and to uh, a consequent hope to the entire people may enjoy the mode will change from despair unto hope. So here we are today. The poem, very short, moves in several steps. And from the statement that need to address God to the acknowledgement of God's mercy and confession of hope. And, uh, and then uh, to address all of Israel. Psalm 130 begins, and with a cry to God. And as most elements do, here in the attitude of one is in deep need and expectation of God's help. It differs from some song in the Lent, but being briefer and jumping to praise without more preparation. In Psalms born of distress, the singer either promises to praise God or does so. And the promise or praise is born out of gratitude of the work that God has done in your life when we call upon him to help us. Psalm 130 seems like a very uh, condensed lament that shades and very different than the other. But perhaps this difference from other psalms reflects of one's placement in the larger group. It does not stand alone. Psalm 129 describes the long of the tax of the faithful Israelites and expects God's deliverance. And then Psalm 130 expresses contrition before God. Collectively, these psalms together position or one praying as someone in correct spiritual position before God. When we are in need, we should come to God in total reference and total humility, bowing down to him, expecting him to answer our prayer. So in our lesson this morning, the first part of our study is addressed to the Lord. Psalm 130, verses 1 through 6. God listens. He said, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. And this phrase, out of the depth, mean out of the depths of water, out of the depths of my situation, when I'm in my deepest hurt, when in my worst of situations, when things uh, leave me in a place where I have no other way to turn but turn to God. He said, out of the depths of my concerns, of my situations that I in, I cry to thee, O Lord. He said these depths could remind him of hell or Sheol, the sin of the earth, from the deepest and furthest uh, away from God that you could ever be. When you find yourself the farthest away from God, you need to cry out to God to have him to come see about you in those situations. He says that uh, this cry out is a cry of desperation. And we are crying because we have nowhere to turn to but God. He says that out of the depths I cry unto you. And then he said, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ear be attended to the voice of my supplication. And this opening address, Lord, continues with the competition for him to listen to him. He said, Lord, hear my voice and let thine ears be attentive to my supplications. And this may be able to let him know that uh, this is an expression of God's favor to come upon their life. He cares for them and he begins to listen attentively uh, to their supplication, acting to alleviate those specific concerns that, uh, uh, that you are praying about. And as common in Psalms, we do not know the specific of the situation in the writing, but we do know that when you are in a place where you have nowhere else to turn, when you're in the depths of your situation, you need to call upon the Lord and ask him to come hear about me and uh, be attentive to the voices of my uh, prayers and my supplications. Verse 3, 
He said, uh, God forgives. If thou, Lord, shouldest make mock iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? He says here, he's asking the question, who can stand if he has to stand before God with all of his sin before him? He says, who is able to stand if God doesn't mock our iniquities? Here, yeah, God who punishes all evil immediately will need no space for human survival. But a God who ignores evil doings altogether will cause even greater harm. So we have a God that, that he also shows us mercy, but we have a God that judges us. We have a God uh, of judgment, and he will judge us whether we do good or bad. But we expect God uh, to do good to us when we do good. But when we are wrong, we expect God's uh, chastisement. He has to discipline us. I talked about it on Friday evening. God's discipline is necessary for us to be able to grow in the fullness of what he desires us to be. If a parent does not chastise his child, that child will uh, be disobedient and turn away. But when that parent chastises the child, he not only shows his care for the child, but he shows his love. God loves us because he chastises us. But if not for the mercies of God, who can stand? The writer is expressing today, but he says in verse 4, But there is forgiveness in thee that thou mayest be feared. He said, but ties it closer to verse 3, implying the sequence closely related events, the experience or even observation of God's forgiveness and its consequences for human life create a sense of awe in the impersonable uh, human. And here the psalmist says, knowledge of God's inclination toward his mercy, it becomes clear that God's mercy is always evident in our life if we would call upon him. Mentioning sin is like touching the psalmist's reason for writing to repent of sinful behavior and to seek God's forgiveness. The psalmist assumes that God delights in forgiveness and to repair his life will make things possible for him. By appealing to God's mercy, the person's praying also commits to reform. So if I ask God for help, God expects me to be able to uh, commit to reform my life if I ask him uh, to do so. I have a part in the equation to be able to make that change in my life. But he says that forgiveness for thee may be feared. We have to fear uh, what the forgiveness of God. Uh, we, we have to respect him because of his love and his mercy. Divine gentleness. See, uh, what forgiveness does, forgiveness creates another path. A path that leads to other avenues of our relationship with God. G divine gentleness with the people in, in, in inspires awe in the part because it seems so difficult for human inclinations toward one another. God shows us love and mercy and forgiveness when our human inclination tells us not to do so. God is much different than you and I. We, he's a merciful God, and we are individuals, we have a hard, difficult time even showing mercy to those that we love. But verse 5a says, I will wait on the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I have hope. So he said that because of the expectation of what God is going to do in my life, I have the propensity to wait. I will wait upon the Lord uh, to be able to, for him to do the work that he has to do in my life. He said the word, word here is the soul has more robust meaning than we consider an English word. Uh, he's talking about mind, soul, and body. Every makeup of our being is there for God to be able to, to, to wait on us and, and our soul, our total life, everything that we have should be waiting on the Lord. We have that type of ability to give God everything that we have. He says, my soul does wait. He claims to anticipate God's saving work with every fiber of his being. And he says that the hope is a synonym for waiting on God. We never hope in vain, but we have a place of hope in his promises. See, God's word refers here is not the law as it might be, but his promise of salvation given to Abraham. He said that through your seed, 
all the peoples and nations of the earth shall be blessed. So we become their primary focus on, on faith, faithful persons of life that having confidence in their promise will shape the behavior for a lifetime as well. So when we have God working in our lives and, and have that patient waiting for him, we have that expectation that God will work things out in our life. Verse 6 says, My soul waits for the Lord more than it would watch for the morning, more than it would watch for the morning. Uh, this phrase here is repeated over to be able to help us recognize uh, that this petition is expressing the intensity of the waiting of God's working in our lives. So we're going to wait on God as long as we can wait on him to do the work that he has for our life. And then he tells us to address to Israel, hope in God. Verse 7 says, let Israel hope in the Lord, for the with the Lord there is mercy. In these two verses, the psalm shifts the focus uh, from the individual psalmist into the whole community. And this sort of shift frequently occurs in psalms of lament, and but and one lacks any transition the psalm turns from the address to God to address to the people. The hope especially of God's mercy that the psalm is expressing in his circumstances is prescribed to gather the community together. And then part B says, and with him is plenteous redemption. See, the Hebrew word behind this redemption, it, it means that God has severed or he has redeemed, he has uh, torn away what sin does to us, and he has now redeemed us with his blood. And in the related verse here says, gives us confidence that redemption is an appropriate translation in our text today. While we don't often, as it says, redemption is a legal metaphor, in Israel, the term, it says, slaves are set free. So we are redeemed from the slavery of sin that is over our lives. So when God frees us, he frees us not only of the power of sin, but he frees us from the penalty of sin. God gives us the power to overcome as well as he gives us the power to set us free. So as we receive redemption, verse 8 says, and he shall receive Israel from all of his iniquities. As the lament often do, the psalm ends with the expression of deep trust in God and the ending uh, reposition of, of the whole poem because it moves the readers from focusing on the individual to God's care for the entire people. So our responsibility in the church is more than just for ourselves. We are a community. We belong to God as a body of people. So we are our brother's keeper. We are responsible for each and every one in the body of Christ. My behavior affect your life and your behavior affect my life. What I do affect you and what you do affect us. So the body of Christ is affected by the whole. So God is coming to redeem not us as individuals, but he's coming back looking for a church. He says that he's looking for a church without spot or wrinkle. And this church is coming from the east and the west. He says from every nation. That's the promise that he made to Abraham that through your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. So through Jesus Christ, the redeeming blood of Israel, that he will come and redeem all, not individual, but collectively bring us into that full fellowship with him. So as we conclude this morning, Psalm 130 speaks of the faith that involves of waiting for God's grace to make it uh, known into our lives. But during this time, the person may doubt God's ability or willingness to save us, questioning his integrity and, uh, and like other human beings. But even sometimes we might even lose self-respect. Waiting for salvation challenges every fiber of our personal being. Yet that challenge, it strengthens Faith is in the long run. And this psalm makes clear, trust in God does not come without some doubts. And will God listen? Per biblical faith is not uh, a, 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 a Pollyanna attitude about life. It is a realistic and honest about the hardship of life. Yet it does not remain that. The spiritual challenges that we face in life, the depths that we have to face, 
become those opportunities for God's grace to work in our life. Therefore, learning to be disciplined on waiting is part of learning to live for God and all others who are also waiting for God's help. In this psalm, in short, it exposes an important truth of our human nature, our profound need and desire for God's presence to be in our lives. And as part of the community of pilgrims seeking God's presence each and every day, the faithful person can speak to God. And even in the most desperate moments of your life, the communal worship of this Israelite community in our text acknowledges that fact. God does not skimp on the acts that will benefit human beings. Rather, he frequently engages with them. And worship in the community still reminds us of God's mighty acts. May we, in our darkest moments, in the grasp of our sins uh, that don't want to let go of us, let us cry out to God. Cry out to God and heed to the call of hope in his saving words. So our prayer today is, O oh God, who hears and cries of your broken people and sees our tear-stained faces, who suffers broken hearts and shattered relationships, hear every cry from the depths of us as well. And do not forget us in the day of our distress and help us not to forget to be thankful when we have been rescued with as many of the methods as you have put to our disposal. In Jesus' name, let us all say amen. So our thought to remember this morning is faith celebrates our hope in God and forgiveness and calls others to do the same. Faith celebrates our hope in God's forgiveness and he calls all of us to do the same. We should have the same grace that God has for us that we should have for our fellow man. God bless you today. We hope that you've received this lesson and will be able to understand that we should wait in expectation for God's mercy and his work that he's doing in our lives. God bless you this morning. May heaven ever smile upon you. And uh, let us close out in prayer. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, again for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come. And now, Lord, as we about to leave this part of the service, allow your Holy Spirit to remain so that as we enter into worship, that you will guide our tongue, guide everything that we do, that it must be done to uplift your holy and your righteous name. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, let everyone say amen. God bless you.